start, Jose, if there's not yes. anyone else coming right now. Oh, you can. Let's start. Yeah. Good morning. I am Jose German, CEO and founder of the Northeast Earth Coalition. We are a volunteer driven environmental nonprofit organization that works at community level to protect the environment and promote local sustainability and food security. We are really amazed by the response that we got for this webinar. More than 100,000 people checked the events and more than 600 were registered to attend it. We have people from Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland. And I heard also West Virginia, and of course, in New Jersey. We are very happy to have all of you today. So let's welcome and introduce our speaker. Deb Ellis is an environmental activist, retired social justice lawyer, and interfaith minister. She's the founder and co-leader of the Exe County Chapter of Native Plant Society of New Jersey. She's a master gardener. She has also served on the Montclair Environmental Commission, and her yard is a certified backyard habitat through the National Wildlife Federation uh, since 2005. Deb has served in leadership position in many nonprofit organizations and was named as a champion of the chain, as champion of change by President Obama. It is not in her official bio, but I know that for about 20 years, and she's an incredible human being. She's kind and generous, and her solidarity is extraordinary. Deb, the Northeast Earth Coalition is honored to have you today. Thank you so much, Jose. So we're gonna start out by watching a little video about the Northeast Earth Coalition here. So I want to thank Jose and the Northeast Earth Coalition for sponsoring this talk today. And I want to thank all of you for coming to the talk. Um, I'm going to do a little Zoom things. I know many of you have been on Zoom meetings. But first of all, I would like you to mute yourself. Um, Jose is probably going to mute the whole group, but I would like you to mute yourself. You also could turn off your video um, because we have so many people on this um, on this call, it will probably help make sure we don't have any Zoom problems if everyone turns off their video that uses less bandwidth. This is um, going to be, we're going to, um, at the very end, take questions. So if you do have questions on, as we're going along, please write a note to yourself and write it in the chat box at the very end because um, then um, I can answer them. I will see them then. Um, if you have some other urgent question, you can try writing in the chat box and maybe Jose will be able to answer it. Um, but I will not be checking the chat box till I'm done. Um, I suggest that you put this on speaker view so you can see the slide better. Um, that way you'll only have see about four faces or four boxes. And you'll, this is set up. If you move the, the speaker view usually comes over to the right hand side. And the PowerPoint is set up that pictures are on the right-hand side so you won't miss the text. So that's what I would suggest you do. Or even you can move the speaker box, I think, um, to minimize it totally. Um, okay, so that's the preliminaries. And now we're going to begin with why do I love to grow herbs and why should you too, if you haven't already? Well, herbs pack a lot of punch. They add flavors, scents, color, nutrition. They're basically wild plants incognito. 
we've long valued them for their flavors and aromas. And so we haven't tried to change them. Um, we haven't given them a flavor makeover. And we've done that to many of our foods. Many of our foods have been hybridized to be sweeter. Um, and therefore they've lost nutrition in the process. Um, so, but because we've left herbs alone, they have kept their nutrient content. Um, and I want to say that herbs can be used medicinally, but this talk is only about culinary use. I am not um, an herbalist and I don't want to um, give any advice about that. And the one thing I would say is, although I'm a big proponent of I would say everything should be used in moderation. There's 100 people. John, whoever is the list of John Towles, the little girl is speaking, if you can mute yourself, or maybe Jose, you can mute everyone. Um, okay, so herbs, they are um, rewarding to grow because, um, oh, I'm muted now. So. No, you are not. Okay, good. I'm, the, um, ver Herbs are really rewarding because they're so tasty and so cost effective. A lot of times a recipe will call for some herbs and if you go buy them, you only need a little of them and the rest go to waste. So um, it's really helpful to just grow them yourself and you can go out and pick what you need and not waste the money. It's really economical. They also need very little space. You can grow them in a pot. Um, my son, I made a, we lived in a basement apartment in Jersey City, New Jersey, a very urban town. And my, um, uh, I made a little pot for him of chives and mint. And it grew in basically a little, um, that was just like a little entryway. Um, and it was concrete and really was like in this shade of the stoop and it still grew. grew. As I mentioned, herbs are very nutritious because many of them um, have because the most beneficial phytonutrients a lot of times are more bitter, sour, or astringent, like we are told to eat kale because it's good for us. So as I mentioned, herbs have not been hybridized to be sweeter. Um, and although I'm not an herbalist, I do um, subscribe to that view that food is my medicine and medicine is my food. So I try to eat really healthfully and use herbs every day um, in the summertime when I'm growing them which for me is April to November, so almost the whole year. And um, I hope that you can find the joy of herbs too if you don't already have them. So the plan today is to, um, this workshop is really oriented towards people who are not master gardeners, who have not grown a lot of herbs. So I wanna tell you that. I hope it's not a herb, it's a herb one workshop, not an herb um, 105 or something. Um, so I wanna just give you that um, caveat. And the plan is we're first going to give some general info about how to get started, how to use herbs, and how to preserve them. And then we're going to talk in a little detail about 14 different herbs, um, perennial herbs, annuals, and four edible flowers. If you're a beginning gardener, you may ask, well, what's the difference between a perennial and an annual? A perennial is a plant that will come back every year once you've planted it. So they're really the most cost effective and the easiest. Annuals have to be planted every year. Um, so I'm going to do a mixture of them because I want to um, tell you about both, but the perennials are actually valuable. I'm going to say to everyone who's joined since I first gave this instruction, it's probably valuable to, um, to uh, turn off your video. It saves bandwidth on a large Zoom call. Okay, so our getting started um, tips. One is to go for seedlings rather than seeds because you... Um, it's just gonna be more rewarding and easier that you can use a plant and it's gonna succeed rather than starting seeds and making frustrated. The other thing, reason to use seedlings is that a lot of times in herbs, you only need a couple of plants, one maybe or two. And so it's really cost effective to buy the seedlings. The second piece of advice is to grow what you like to eat. And that's what I've tried to focus on here. If you're an experienced gardener, you might wanna start uh, growing herbs you've never heard of or never used, that would be a fun experiment. But if you're beginning, do the things that you most like to eat and that will be the most rewarding for you. Third is any gardening starts with good soil. And so you should enrich your soil if you can with compost or worm castings, which is what they sound like, they're worm poop. You can find those at garden stores and um, 
online. And I make my own compost, as does Jose. We're organic gardeners. So we prefer not to use fertilizer. And I don't think most herbs really need fertilizer, but they need a good start with some enriched soil. Most herbs lead, need at least six hours of sun. Um, there's three that are okay in, little, in less sun, mint um, and parsley and chives. But in general, most herbs will do better with six hours of sun or more. Herbs really do need good drainage. They're not gonna do well if you have like a, um, a wet backyard as I do in many places of my backyard. So if you don't have good drainage, you could try growing them in a pot or a raised beds. And then for design of the herbs, um, the, the best advice is to put them close to the um, kitchen so that you can use them and then, um, and then you can um, use them easily. Um, and you can design it in three different ways. You could just have herbs by itself in a pot or have an herb garden, which people used to do a lot, or you can mix them with your flowers or you can mix them with your vegetables. It's your choice. I do a little of all three. Um, one advantage of mixing them with your vegetables is that many herbs are good companion plants. And what do I mean by a companion plant to vegetables? What I mean is that you can, um, using the herbs like marigolds or basil next to your, for example, tomatoes can decrease the pests and increase the um, root strength of the tomatoes. So many um, plants like marigolds attract beneficial insects that will then eat the insects we don't want. So it's an organic way of using insecticides, of having certain plants be your insecticides. So even if you do want an herb garden, I would definitely encourage you to use marigolds and some other things in your vegetable garden too, because it's a nice um, companion plant. So how do we use the herbs we're gonna grow? Well, I'll talk about that a little bit with the individual herbs, but here's some ideas of um, different ways to use them from savory to sweet. You can use rosemary and shortbread cookies, and I'll have a recipe for that at the end on the Northeast Coalition um, website. The, um, I like to chop a lot of my herbs right into salads so that my salads in the summer have a varied um, flavor. Um, many of them can be used for teas and they can be added to all kinds of marinades and um, just in real, your imagination has no limit. Here's a picture of a salad I made, a last simple salad last summer with watermelon and cucumbers. And then I added chives and mint, a little oniony taste, a little sweet taste to just give it zing and it was great. Um, the other thing I wanna say here is that you can substitute herbs for each other in recipes. So generally you can substitute soft herbs for other soft herbs. So that would include on the soft ones, basil, lovage, parsley, mint, um, dill, um, which I'm not actually going to be doing today, um, but all those can be substituted for each other and you can substitute woody ones for each other, like oregano, sage, rosemary, and thyme. This is not a hard and fast rule. I often substitute oregano if it calls for basil. So you can do whatever you want, but that's just a guide to give you more freedom to realize that you can do the substitutions and then you can use what you're growing. So preserving herbs, some, you could do a whole workshop on preserving and that's not what this is going to be today, but I want to just emphasize the best way to use herbs is to use them. <laughs> the more you snip, it's abundance, it's an abundance, abundance, abundance. The more you use them, the more bushy, healthy, and flavorful your herbs will be. So have no fear that using them will decrease them, they'll increase them. You can store them in the fridge like I just um, showed here in this picture by putting them in a glass of water and a plastic bag over it. It's probably a better tip for when you buy herbs from the store because the advantage of growing them is you can just do it when you use the herbs when you want to. And to dry um, herbs for winter, the woody ones do work the best for that. Um, so because they have the more volatile oils that can be dried. So the oregano, rosemary, sage, thyme, they can be hung up um, upside down on a string or on a like closed drying rack. And if you want, you can put a paper bag around them. It's best to dry them in a dark, airy place, but it could be even a closet. Okay, now we're gonna start with looking at um, some perennial herbs. 
Um, the first one is chives. And I think if there's just a few things you grow, I would grow chives and parsley and basil probably. Um, chives are so easy. They um, uh, have a light oniony taste and they can grow in sun or light shade. They have a very long season. It makes me so happy every spring to go out in my garden and see the chives coming up as the first green thing I can eat. Um, and this is actually from um, Jose's, uh, Jose's window box here. And, um, the, uh, and then they also go a really long time. You can still be using them in, um, sorry, um, in uh, October. And one pot of them is enough because they'll spread. A lot of the herbs, one plant will be enough. And you'll usually, when you buy them, you'll get many stalks in a pot and that will be enough to start out with. They have a widespread use in so many summer salads, um, like egg salad, tuna salad, um, uh, chicken salad. And I also just like to cook them in eggs. I like to make scrambled eggs in the summer and put in a bunch of the herbs from my garden to make um, green eggs, maybe not green eggs and ham, but at least the green eggs. You harvest them by taking them from the bottom and um, using the whole stem. And I then take the whole stem, fold it in half and cut it with a scissors so that that's a fast way to get it, get it into my cooking. The flowers are also edible. This is a picture of um, Jose's window box this week um, when the flowers are blooming. And you can take these flowers and put them in your salads or your eggs. I've done both this week. The stems of the, um, of the chives that have gone to flower are a little more woody and harder to use. So I just put those in my compost. But once the um, flowers are gone, the chives will keep producing all summer and you can keep using them. Um, one thing I want to say in general, a good tip is don't let your herbs go to flower. If they flower, they are going to go to flower, cut them off. This is true of any herb because the um, plants have a... Uh, their mission is to reproduce. And so they want to reproduce with their flowers and then they would stop producing so much of their other parts. So you wanna cut off the flowers, even if you don't use them, and then you can, um, uh, and then they'll keep producing better. So that's true for all. So here's an herb that even if you grow herbs, you may not have heard about, it's called lovage. And if there's one herb you wanna to try today that you, I would say go home and try to find, I mean, you're home, <laughs> sorry. Go out and try to get a lovage plant. Um, it's very easy to grow. It gets tall. Um, mine never gets six feet tall because I use it so much. This is mine um, about a month ago. Um, but all you need is one plant because it's gonna keep growing um, upright and it's a perennial like all these are so it keeps coming back very um, fully like that. Um, the lovage, the common name refers to the plant's European reputation as a love charm. Um, well I've never used it as a love charm but it sure it brightens my cooking. Um, it tastes of, uh, of celery and parsley and some people say with over notes of curry which is interesting because I just think it tastes more interesting to me than celery. And I never grow love, I never buy celery, sorry, I never buy celery in the summer because I can use my lovage instead. So I feel like my lovage saves me a lot of money. Um, and I use it in all the ways I would use celery. The, um, in Germany, they use this um, a lot and they call it Magi Kraut because they believe it tastes like beef bouillon, similar to a liquid Magi seasoning that they use for soups. Um, and the, I use the leaves, by the way, and all the kinds of um, salads that I make with it. I like tuna salad and egg salad. Um, and then I can use the stems if I'm making soup. The stems are a little tougher. And if I use the stems, I cut them really small. And I also, um, I'm going to only cook them. So last night I was making some tomato sauce and I was cooking it quickly. And I just added the leaves, didn't even add the stems. And it gave it some delightful flavor. So lovage, I also want to talk about the availability. Not every place is going to have it. It's a little harder to find, um, but the way that we can get these hard to find herbs being sold is to ask our local nurseries for them. Or you could try to find some seeds and they're not hard to start from seed. You just may not really get um, a plant that you can harvest from this year, but you could make it a little project to grow some and give them to friends and then you'd have them for the rest of your life. Next is mint. So mint is um, a, a wonderful sweet 
herb that has both savory and sweet uses though. Um, it's one of the ones that prefers partial sage or at least can do okay in that um, and grows well in the sun too. The main thing about mint to remember when growing it is you have to contain it. Um, mint really likes to spread. So you need to grow it, I believe, either in a pot above ground, which this is, um, or I used to sink, uh, I had a big plastic pot, I took the bottom out of it and I sunk it in my garden. And that worked well too, and then I decided to put it in this pot. It overwintered in this pot, to preserve the pot, you can see that maybe it has had a little wear and tear. I actually put it in my garage last winter to preserve the pot and wasn't sure what that would happen to the mint, but the mint actually survived even though there's only one little window in my garage. Of course it looked terrible, but I didn't water it, I didn't have to do anything to it, and then it sprung back like this with a little compost this spring. Um, I, just to confirm about that story of how um, it spreads, I had a neighbor, a beloved neighbor named Fran, who's since moved away, and she is Greek. And one spring she announced to me, I'm gonna use mint as a ground cover, I'm Greek and I can't have possibly too much mint. Well, by fall, she said, I can have too much mint. It had spread everywhere. So please take my word for it and try to contain it, but do grow it. It's great because it can be used in savory things like marinades for um, poultry and tabbouleh, but it also really adds a nice um, complexity to fruit dessert. The other thing about mint is there's many varieties. I like to grow spearmint, which is kind of the main variety, but there's all kinds like chocolate and many, many kinds. Oregano is another nice herb that's very easy to grow. It, you only need one plant because it will expand, but it won't expand as much as mint. Um, and it really is a nice companion to both tomato dishes um, and it's another component of tabbouleh. Tabbouleh actually uses four different herbs. Um, and is, there's a great recipe from years ago, you could look it up online called Chicken Marbella from the Silver Palette Cookbook, and it uses a lot of oregano um, and uses dried oregano, but you can use fresh instead. In general, one tablespoon of a fresh herb equals one teaspoon of a dried herb. So you can remember that as you're substituting. And it can spread easily, but it's not like mint. I don't think you have to take um, extreme precautions on it. Next, we have sage. Um, sage I love for many reasons. One is that it also comes up very early um, and lasts until December. It's almost more like a bush. Um, it's like a small shrub. It's like mine right now is 12 feet by tall by like two feet wide. So that's two pictures. The first picture is, the top one is from a month ago. And you can see I was just coming up, I could use some of the leaves, but now a month later, look how full it is and how big the leaves are. And so it's very usable. The one thing that I would encourage you to do with your um, sage is to keep it, um, to, to cut it back a little bit in the spring. And that way you can, um, it's possible, it just makes it bloom, not bloom, it, produces more leaves. So the picture you saw in the top, I had not yet cut it back or I had just cut it back. I didn't do it early enough. You probably should do it in early April. And now from the pruning back, I got this nice little shrub. This is one I used to actually have in my little herb garden. And then because it was taking up so much room, I moved it to its own place. And it's really a, a quite um, handsome shrub too, I think. Um, it has a lot of uses. I have a recipe for sweet potato soup with sage at the end. Um, and of course, all kinds of um, poultry uses. It's a great Thanksgiving thing um, to use for stuffing, etc. cetera. Um, thyme is um, our last perennial we're gonna talk about. It uh, is a much smaller leaf here. This shows all the ways I grow herbs. This is in my little, um, box that's on my deck and there's thyme to the right and oregano to the left. So I do have some right outside my door that I can go snip and throw it in eggs or whatever. Um, it can be used as a landscaping ground cover. I did try that once um, and it failed I think because it was um, too wet. Um, so like all herbs it wants to be um, well drained in time. I think even more than others needs kind of sandy well drained soil Although they're also flexible, this is not sandy soil in this box, um, but it is well drained. I wanted to say that one of the things I have in terms of my expertise is just all the trial and error I've done, I have from gardening for more than 20 years and the mistakes I've made. So um, 
uh, you know, I, in general, in gardening, I think it's just great to learn from what you do. And I'm so happy that during this pandemic time that so many people are turning to nature as solace and turning to gardening and growing their own food as a new activity or as a renewed activity. It's a wonderful thing um, for all of us to do that. So now we're going to um, go to the annuals. I do want to mention a couple other perennials that I'm not talking about in detail, but um, they're uh, winter savory, which I think is a great, great perennial, which tastes like pine needles almost, and I love pine needles. So it's like sage and being a small bush, not quite as big as sage. Um, it also benefits from being cut back. Um, and it's distinct from summer savory, which is an annual. So I would, since the perennials require much less work, if you're interested in growing something like that, I would do winter savory. And so many times I'll just go out and pick a whole bunch of these herbs and chop them into different kinds of um, protein salads like egg or tuna salad or just green salads. Um, another perennial herb I wanted to briefly mention before going on to the annuals is salad burnet which is not as productive to me as some of these other herbs, but its leaves taste like cucumber, which is a really unusual herb taste. And so if you want to venture um, deeper into the world of herb growing, I would urge you to look for salad burnet. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the annuals. I just picked a few. I haven't picked, there's many more you could grow like dill or cilantro. I didn't include those because I find that they go, um, they're hard to keep going all summer. Um, although dill freely reseeds and is also a host plant for butterflies. So you might just grow dill for your butterflies. That's a good reason to do it. Cilantro for us in New Jersey, where it does get really hot, often um, uh, starts wilting very early. So I don't usually grow cilantro. So let's talk about what we are including, basil. I sometimes say to people who are starting to garden, if you're gonna grow one thing, grow basil and tomatoes. There's nothing like the two of them and the two of them together. Um, there are some years I have grown enough basil to make 100 um, cups of basil so I can make 50 batches of pesto. I have a daughter who's vegan and I make the pesto without the cheese and she loves my pesto recipe, which again is, list, is included in our list of recipes. It also has a lot of lemon in it. Um, the um, pesto um, that is most common is the Genovese pesto. The, um, the Genoa is called the pesto capital of the world. And um, it's, uh, I think pesto is the best way to preserve basil too. Just make it into pesto. You can even make it in, in your ice cube tray, freeze in your ice cube tray and then take it out and put it in a freezer bag, bag for a delightful pop of flavor in your winter soups. Um, Basil can be grown from seed, and this is one where you do want to have um, many plants, I think, or at least a good number of plants, not just one. Um, but you can also pick it up really inexpensively from, from your garden center. And it's at this point probably too late to start it from seed. Uh, basil and all the annuals really have to wait until May to go into the garden. I know here our local history center had an herb cell in early May, and we got our plants like basil, and then they kind of got frozen. So um, it was a cold spring here. So do wait, it's hard. Um, I think everyone knows that basil can be used on so many tomato dishes. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to take my cherry tomatoes from my garden and chop them up with basils and basil and olives and have like a tomato salad. So, um, and he, this is another example of pinching off the flowers. You really need to pinch those white flowers um, at the, as they come up during the summer so that you can um, keep the plant producing well. Lemon verbena is a less known um, herb than basil, I think, and one I'd encourage you to try. It is in the sweeter category. Um, it has, um, it's a native of South America and brought to Europe by the Spaniards when Victorian ladies then would float the leaves in their finger bowls. I'm sure you won't do that, but the intense lemon fragrance um, is just delightful and adds a delightful flavor to um, uh, tea bread or cookies. I actually, my favorite way to use it is frankly just to um, make a summer evening tea from the fresh leaves in a clear um, teapot I have, a clear glass teapot, and it looks beautiful and it tastes beautiful. It's also a nice um, cocktail garnish. And um, you can dry the leaves to have the tea in the summer too. 
Um, and this, as someone, I read somewhere, the fresh taste is more than lemon un alone, and I agree with that. Um, because it's an annual that gets to be pretty big, it's definitely a plant you should start from a plant um, because the seeds would just take too long. Parsley is um, considered technically a biennial. It's usually something you have to um, start every year, except if it's in a protected place, um, as it has many, many uses. It's probably the least aromatic of all the spices, so it can go in so many things and it's used in so many things. Um, it's, um, you know, it's, and that's one herb where you probably want to have more than one plant because you'll use it in so many different ways. I, this is one because I think it's not so aromatic. I do have trouble with critters eating it. And so that's a good juncture to talk about the critter issue for a moment. The nice thing about most herbs is that the critters don't eat them because um, they are too aromatic. Um, so, and I do have a lot of critters in my backyard. Um, and so what I do with this is I grew it under a cage last year because before the bunnies would just always eat my parsley. But growing under a cage worked and I find sometimes as the plants get bigger, then the animals don't get to them so much. So at the end, I could take the cage off, but also I could keep the cage, um, which was only about a foot high. The plants were fine because I would just keep harvesting them all the time. So um, that's it for parsley. And then our last annual is rosemary. So Rosemary is a perennial in warmer climates. You can go to southern areas of our country or, or Mexico and see beautiful bushes of rosemary. It's just gorgeous. In New Jersey, it usually dies back in the winter um, and it does last a long time. This is um, a plant that I always use at Thanksgiving and even a little bit beyond. And one plant is enough. Now this is from Jose's driveway where he's figured out a great microclimate where it's a little warm enough so that he can overwinter them. This is a picture was taken about a month ago. So this is an overwintered rosemary plant in New Jersey. So there's no absolute rules in gardening a lot of times. And I mean, there are some absolute rules, but um, so this is a situation where it could be a perennial if you can keep it warm. Um, and if not, you can um, just buy one plant because one is all you're going to need. Um, it's a great complement to many meat and fish and Mediterranean dishes, um, as well as roasted vegetables. Um, so if you haven't grown it, try it, it's great. Okay, now we're going to move to the edible four edible flowers. Um, and the first one is marigolds, which I've mentioned are a really good companion plant for tomatoes. Uh, and for basil. So it's something I would want you to put in your vegetable garden if you're doing that. It's really a nice annual that just blooms all summer long. You could have grown it, you could grow it from seed early, but it's easy enough to, and inexpensive enough to get a flat of marigolds at the garden center. Um, you can use the flowers as a uh, colorful garnish. I've never eaten the leaves except once recently a restaurant served them to me, um, but I would be careful about eating too many of the leaves. Um, these two, lemon and orange gem, have mild citrus flavor, um, which is nice. Uh, and the, um, the, again, like all these things, the more you cut them, the more they'll um, produce. So that's true of many flowers too. And the word is called deadheading. It's kind of a silly word. But if you cut off the blooms, you'll get more and more marigolds. And sometimes I've even been able to use marigolds um, as my flower arrangements um, for Thanksgiving. So they will be gone when it freezes, um, especially a hard freeze, but they'll last a long time. Another flower that provides a bright spot of color in salads is nasturtiums, which sometimes you can buy for a very expensive price at farmer's markets, but you can also grow them yourself. Um, they, and in this, unlike the marigolds, you really can eat the leaves too. With marigolds, I'd be uh, cautious on eating the leaves or too many of them. Um, the mer the um, nasturtium is native to Mexico, Chile, and Argentina, um, where it's eaten like watercress, and the botanical name actually is um, the name for watercress. So the leaves, if you've never eaten them, are a little spicy um, and great. I again, I like to chop them up finely and add them to my salads. I don't normally have a salad just of the leaves. Um, and as the nasturtium goes on in the year, in the summer, you will get more, the leaves will get bigger as the time goes on. And so they will be probably the biggest in like August and September. And it's really nice to um, 
have both the flowers and the leaves in your salad. There's a little ditty that you can be nasty to nasturtiums that they don't actually like fertilizer. So they prefer nutrient poor soil. So that's one thing to consider if you, sometimes it's too confusing to me to be putting compost on parts and not on others and I don't worry about it. But this is one place that if you have some bad soil, try a nasturtium there. They can be grown from seed, although it's probably a little late to start them and they're easy to um, buy in the garden st stores. The, the next two flowers we're gonna talk about are um, native flowers that are also edible. So as Jose mentioned, I am the head, the co-leader of the Essex County Native Plant Society and I believe in growing native plants because they not only beautify our lives, but they help heal Mother Earth and um, enhance biodiversity. And they feed our butterflies, our insects, our birds. So I really try to mostly grow native plants in addition to my vegetables and herbs. And the herbs, but you've noticed sometimes I've said where they come from, they're not native, which is okay, that's our food. But the violet is a state flower of four states, including my home state, Wisconsin, where I was born and my current home state. And I think a lot of people don't know, you can eat the leaves and the flowers. People I think know you can eat the flowers. Um, you can candy them, which seems a little precious to me. I did put them in ice cubes last year, which kind of, they kind of wilted though when the ice cubes melted. But I did put the flowers when they were blooming, which they're not really blooming now, they're really done in salads. But the bigger thing is that you can use the leaves. You can cut up the leaves all summer long. Again, I cut them in little strips and add them to my salad. So I have that bit of wild in my salad, the nutrients and the taste. The violet leaves are, unlike the watercress, they're really kind of bland tasting. They're not, they don't have a strong taste. Um, and they, um, as they, after they're done blooming, the leaves get bigger and bigger. Um, and since I have so many problems with rabbits eating lettuce, um, I like growing this because I can add it to salads and the critters don't eat my violets. Um, it can also be used to thicken soup because it's like okra, it kind of has a thickener in it. But I have to say in preparation for this talk, I tried making a recipe the other day, which did not make it to my recipe list of um, a violet soup and it was pretty bland. So I would not make a soup with just violet leaves. Um, I tried and my mistake is your success. You don't have to waste your time. Um, I also tried making ice cream in a mason jar and that didn't work either. Uh, anyway, as a native plant, this is a great native plant. It supports 29 species of butterflies and moss and is a host plant for the fritillary butterflies, which means they will lay their eggs on it and the caterpillars will eat the leaves in order to um, grow, which is really important. If we want butterflies, we need to feed the caterpillars. And our last um, edible flower is the monardas, the, both the wild bergamot and the bee balm, which is red. The one pictured here is the wild bergamot and it um, can grow, it prefers sun or light shade um, and it is pretty really tolerant on the moisture. It's very tall, it's much taller than all the other herbs we've been talking about, three to four feet tall. And this is something that you can use for tea. The word bergamot, the flavoring bergamot is used in Earl Grey tea. So it has a distinctive flavor and you could either dry the leaves or use it fresh. Um, it's also a really good nectar plant for helping the earth um, and attracts beneficial insects. And you can see the picture has a butterfly on it. So that concludes our, um, my uh, discussion of individual herbs. Um, I have a few more slides and then I do want to say we'll stay, um, you know, until like 11.15 or so, as long as we need to take any questions you have and you can um, start writing them in the chat box if you want. Um, and we'll look at the chat box in a few minutes. So I have mentioned a few ways to use the herbs and we have posted seven recipes on the Northeast Earth Coalition blog. Um, tabbouleh, we've tried to post um, herb heavy recipes. Um, so one is tabbouleh, um, a roasted cherry tomato gratin that I love making at the end of the season and putting a lot of different um, herbs in it. It originally called for parsley and that's one thing I'm gonna tell you. If you're growing your herbs and you see a recipe that calls for parsley, think about putting more things in because it'll be more flavorful. And that's what I've done with that recipe. I've changed it um, 
to include lots of herbs and it tastes better. There's another very interesting herb spread, which is mostly herbs. It's almost like a pesto, but it has anchovies in it. And we use that as a spread on bread with like a soup for lunch. Um, and it's just very flavorful and very hearty and satisfying. And then I have recipes for pestos, the traditional basil one and a sage pesto. And because it's sage, you need to add parsley to it. So it's parsley and sage. And then of course you can use um, herbs in many, many soups, but there's one I put on for sweet potato soup. And then just to give you an example of using herbs, um, a savory herb in a sweet way, I have a great recipe for lemon rosemary cookies, um, shortbread cookies that is really, really delicious. So do look in the Northeast Coalition site for that, but don't be limited that by that. I really want you to take away from this the idea of being really creative because you're growing your herbs, you don't have to buy them and think about all the different ways that you can experiment. One idea is to take a cup of chopped herbs and put them into a burger, whether it's a Beyond Burger or a beef burger or a poultry burger, and make it an herb burger. Really add that nutrition and the wild flavors to um, what other might, might be just a plain burger. Um, because the herbs, to say that again, they bring, they bring photonutrients and wild flavor to what we eat. So they're fun to grow, but they help us um, to be healthier people. So I want to thank you all for taking time to be with us today on this beautiful sunny day. I hope you can use some of the rest of it to plant herbs. I did hear some in the beginning asking a family member to go buy some herbs, so that was great. Um, Remember to eat your greens for health. Um, and I hope that I've inspired you a little bit to enjoy nature more and be more healthy by growing herbs or trying a new herb recipe. And I, you know, buy some lovage seeds or buy a few lovage plants and share them with a friend. We can all do our part to be part of the solution to the, um, the complex crises that are faced by Mother Earth right now. And with that, I wanna also take a moment to thank the Northeast Earth Coalition. The Northeast Earth Coalition, which Jose, as he mentioned, is this, the founder and CEO of, is a total volunteer staffed organization that works to help those in need, those in need for, of food, it helps to grow community gardens, and those in need of beauty and helping the earth because it also specializes in making plants of native gardens and sharing native plants. Um, they, because they're all volunteer run, 100% of your donations will go to support their programs. So um, we did this program together for free, but if you have any money to spare and want to be and are able to be part of the solution, please go to Northeast northeastearthcoalition.org at the donation link and make a donation to um, help them continue their work. And I want to um, thank Jose for thinking of, of taking advantage of this pandemic time to reach more people than we would have ever reached when I first volunteered to do this and we thought maybe there'd be 10 to 20 people at an in-person workshop. So the pandemic gives us opportunities to make lemonade out of lemons or lemon verbena. Um, and with that, um, we're going to open it up for questions in a minute. Thank you, Dad, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I learned a lot today, so um, any question that you may have, this is the moment. <clears throat> 